All right. Welcome to week three of, oh, actually it's week four of RIT Sec. Let's go. All right. Let's get into the normal announcements. Sign in. There's a QR code. If you want the domain, that's the domain. Go to that, and you can sign in. Give everyone a second. Cool. If you want pizza and you want to participate in elections and be considered a member of a club, please sign in. It's very helpful. All right. Join our Discord if you haven't already. Discord.ritsec.club. Uh, that's where everything is. Make sure you get on that. Um, if you want to see what's happening, what events are coming up, we have a calendar. So uh, make sure to check that out. Um, Calendar.ritsec.club. Um, you can see when all our interest groups meet, when, when we meet, other stuff, anything that is happening, you can keep track of it. We have a mailing list. If you want nice newsletters at 2.30 a.m., um, make sure to sign up at uh, mail.ritsec.club, and you can stay up to date on everything that will happen that week and any upcoming events. So make sure to add yourself to that. All right. We have a board applications open. If you are interested in serving for a board, we have two positions. We actually have three. These are two of them. Max will talk about the next one later. We have a web admin position open. This is the person who will be taking care of our club website. And we have a social event lead. This will be someone who will help set up social events, stuff like that. So if you are interested in either of those positions, um, Scan the QR code, sign up. We will be posting those links on the Discord, so if you cannot get them, do not worry. Awesome. Make sure you apply if you are interested. Uh, we still have swag. If you still have swag you haven't picked up, please come to the club room and talk to one of the eboard members. We will help you out. Please make sure you bring like proof that you actually competed or something like that, so we know you're not just like stealing it. Cool. Um, all right, let's clap it up for the sponsors this week. We have two new sponsors. Yay. Yeah, yeah. Woo! All right, and I think that is it for announcements this week. Follow our social media if you feel like it. And uh, I think we will be moving on to networking with Professor Weissman. Made it simple this time. Yeah. All right. How's everybody doing today? We are live streaming in two separate instances of Zoom, so I'm wearing two uh, lavalier microphones and I'm going to be advancing two simultaneous PowerPoint presentations. So bear with me as I just look things over. OK, I got things pretty much set. It's an honor to give this presentation. I've done this presentation at RITSEC, formerly known by other different names in the past, probably going back uh, six or seven years right now. I just want to ask those of you that have been in this presentation before, Please do not say anything that may or may not be coming up. Already a couple of people who have been at this presentation in the past have uh, mentioned what might be coming up. Shh, just don't tell anybody. Also, if you're watching on my LinkedIn Live right now, please post a comment in terms of where you are, who you are, just to get a record of everybody that's there as well. If you're watching in the Twitch stream as well, post a comment of who you are and where you're coming in from. Let me just see. I could clip this on. Yeah, clip this on. Clip this tight. Hang on. There we go. Also, if I walk too far, everything's going to come tumbling down probably on me. So if that's the case, just pick it up and class dismissed. 
All right, I've got a bunch of things on the agenda today. If you take a look, I'm going to give you a little bit of everything in the 45 minutes that I can in the world of networking, starting with what I call two funny stories. First story, these happened over the summer. There were a bunch of families that moved into Brighton, about 15 minutes away from here where my family and I live. And we liked some of the families, and we didn't like some of the families. We wanted to be friends with some of the families, and we didn't want to have any association with some other families. They had bad cybersecurity hygiene, so we wanted to stay away from them. So what we did was my wife made a couple of care packages, uh, chocolate, fruits, things along those lines. And she said, Jonathan, go ahead and deliver this particular care package to the Smith family. So I, I met Bob Smith in uh, Wegmans earlier that summer, and they have kids. The Smiths have kids our age. So I figured, why not? We'll strike up a friendship with that particular family. So here I am. It's a uh, Sunday night, let's say 11.35 p.m., middle of the summer, end of July maybe, and I just realized something. Didn't know what Bob Smith's address was. I knew his name, but I, I didn't know what his address was. So what I did was, this was at 11.30 at night, our kids had gone to bed already. So I, I took my 500 watt amplifier, I'm also a musician. I took our fi my 500 watt amplifier out, put it on the stoop, and I uh, jacked the volume all the way up to 10, and I shouted, so maximum effect all over the place. And I said, Bob Smith, uh, what street number house are you located in? And who in Brighton heard that? Everybody, including my kids. My wife was so mad at me. Uh, she had done a good job putting the kids to bed. I'm usually the goody-goody with the kids. So I let them stay up late. But she got them to bed early on that Sunday night, and I woke them up. So I woke up our kids. I woke up all the kids in the neighborhood. I woke up all the adults in the neighborhood. I was creating a public disturbance, uh, so much so that uh, Bill Maley was actually called, but he and I smoothed things over. But you know what? I did get Bob Smith's attention. And I was able to get Bob Smith to come to my house in Brighton and say, um, our address is 123 Main Street. And then he walked back discreetly to his house because he didn't want to be associated with me. Somebody's causing such a public disturbance. And then later that night, after I got Bob Smith's house address, I brought the care package to his house. And then we became friends with the Smiths. That's a cool story, right? Story number one. That's one story that happened over the summer. Another story that happened over the summer, um, my family and I finally, after uh, COVID uh, situation, we're, it's obviously still ongoing, but we were able to take a trip down to my relatives in Staten Island, New York, and my wife's relatives in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. By the way, you guys know the difference between in-laws and outlaws? What's the difference between in-laws and outlaws? Outlaws are, outlaws are wanted, right, very good. Oh, are we recording this? I, I really do like my in-laws. I, I love my in-laws. So what happened was we went to my parents' house in Staten Island. They still live there. In fact, this is a picture of the bedroom I grew up in in Staten Island. We took a picture there. And then when we got back to Rochester after the trip, I was bringing the bags in from the car, and they seemed kind of heavy. I was like, what's going on over here? And then all of a sudden, I, I pull out of the bags, uh, one from Noah's bag and one from Jacob's bag. I, I pulled out these really massive, heavy candlestick holders. And they were my mom's. And they were uh, gold-plated, diamond-plated. They, they just had a lot of stuff going on on them. And they were very, very heavy. And I said to uh, Noah and Jake, I called them, and I said, what is this stuff? And they said, oh, uh, Grandma, let us have them. I'm like, are you sure about that? And they said, yeah, grandma was having And then I, I checked my email, and my mom sent me like six emails. We, it's a six-hour drive. I got an email like every hour, where are my candlestick holders? So I, I replied back, uh, you know, I thought that you let the kids have them. And she just said, no, they were looking at them. I said they could play with it. They couldn't have it. So here's what happened. I had to get those candlestick holders back to my parents in Staten Island, New York, from Rochester. So what I did was I Googled the nearest UPS store closest to my home. And I put them in a brown box, and I dropped the package off at the UPS store, and UPS took care of the rest. That's story number two. Cool stories, right? OK. I thought we'd start with some cool stories before we learn about networking. Now, about local versus remote traffic. 
when devices that are on the same network have traffic for each other. That's considered local traffic. Local traffic is when you're on the same network, also known as LAN, local area network, also known as subnet, also known as broadcast domain. When you're on the same network as the destination, that's local traffic. If you're on a different network, a different logical IP subnet than the actual destination, that's considered remote traffic. And by the way, if I forget to advance uh, one of these slide sets, please let me know. That's the uh, first instance of that. All right, so when you deliver local traffic, it's like you got to move from a bank to a supermarket to, uh, to Starbucks to a Dunkin' in terms of the same city, the device that your traffic, your packets move through is called a switch. Think of the switches as the local streets of a city where the end stations are banks, coffee houses, supermarkets, or the like. And what are you as you move from one of these locations to the next? You're just a network packet. But the switch allows the network packets to move within frames from one location to the next location. These locations are end devices, just like a bank is an end device. Starbucks is an end device. But what would be an end device in the world of networking? You got a laptop, you got a printer, you got a camera, you got mobile devices, you got a desktop. Those are the end devices that are all connected and interconnected through the switch. If you have remote traffic, you never directly talk to the actual destination. Remote traffic is indirectly delivered through a thing called a router, which means routers are not meant to deliver traffic from one device to the next. Routers are meant to be, be uh, the intermediary to pass traffic from one network to another network. So you can think of it as local highways where you go from one highway to the next. You go from 90 to 490, for instance, or to 590. And when you move from one highway to the next, you go from city to city or state to state. That's analogous to the world of networks that we're talking about. All right, that's all nice and dandy, but how are these individual network devices addressed? Well, there are actually two types of addresses, in fact, three that we're going to be talking about today. The first one is an IP address which goes by a few different uh, adjectives. It's logical, which means it's not physical. It's implemented in software, which means it's not implemented in hardware. It's hierarchical, which means various portions of that IP address mean different things and are proportional to different things that we're going to be talking about. And it's also geographical. Now, IPv4 was not geographical from the start when it debuted on January 1st, 1983, also known as Flag Day, IP addresses, IPv4 addresses, were made to be geographical at some point. IPv6 addresses have been geographical from the start. What that means is you can look at an IP, you can look at an IP address and know from which locale, in some cases continents, in some cases countries, that IP address originates from. So far so good? I'm going to take questions. Any questions or comments or keep on going? Now, remember I said that the IP address is hierarchical and there are two specific, different components that comprise an IP address. The first part is known as a network ID, which means that all devices on the same network start off with that same prefix, that same network ID. The other portion of the IP address is known as a host ID, which means a unique string in totality, unique to each device on a network, sort of like a serial number. How do you tell where the network ID ends and where that host ID begins? There's something called a subnet mask. Now, I actually brought one today to show you. So this is a good example. Bear with me. Other ear? So this is an example of a subnet mask used during COVID times. In fact, I got another subnet mask. This one is KN95 proof. Subnet masks are also, like IP addresses, series of numbers that represent something. In terms of an IP address, the series of numbers represents both the network ID and the host ID. 
And if you take a look at our pattern right over here, an IP address consists of four bytes, or four base 10 values that are, of course, underneath the hood, eight bits. You got eight bits times four, that's 32 bits, that's 32 bytes. The subnet mask follows the same pattern. The subnet mask is used with the IP address to identify which part of the IP address is a network portion shared by every device on the network, sort of like a zip code, and which portion of the IP address is unique in totality, the host ID, sort of like a serial number or device number. What you're looking at right now are two ways that the IP address can be represented. This column over here shows you that the IP addresses can be represented in base 10, and they usually are in the world of IPv4 when configuring them, but when saying them and when referencing them when the world went to a classless way of addressing in the 90s, because that classful way, we'll talk about another time, just wasn't going to cut it. This is known as CIDR, like a Apple CIDR, classless interdomain routing. CIDR notation has a slash followed by a number that represents a value of the subnet mask. For instance, in this subnet mask right over here. Oh, I'm sorry. You guys can't see me moving that mouse. I have to move two mice at the same time. In this subnet mask right over here, 255.255.00, that consists of 16 ones followed by 16 zeros. So the number after the slash in the CIDR notation represents how many ones you have in the subnet mask. Why is that significant? Because when you take your IP address and you line up those 32 bits across, and then you take the subnet mask and you put it directly underneath every IP address bit that has a one underneath it in the subnet mask portion is a network bit and comes down as is. Any bit in the IP address that has a zero underneath it in the subnet mask portion is a host bit and actually comes down as a zero. A network ID is an IP address where all host bits are set to zero. So in this example right over here, if we're using a slash 16 subnet mask or 255.255.0.0, what would you say the network ID is over here? Bueller, Bueller. Give me an answer. Braden, give me an answer. Network ID, network ID slash 16 subnet mask. Beautiful way to put you on the spot and way to respond. 172.16.0.0 because the eight ones underneath the 172 bits mean bring those bits down as is. Same with the eight bits under the 16. The eight zeros under the 254 and under the one mean turn those bits into zeros. So the network ID has all zeros for its host bits. Based on this, now we're able to know which part of the IP address is a network portion and which part is the host portion. Without an IP address, with uh, having a complementary subnet mask, you can't really tell anything about that particular network. IP addresses, one million percent need complementary subnet masks. Now, let's say, that's yours and that's mine. Let's say a source with an IP address of 10.0.0.1 wants to send traffic, wants to send a message, to a destination IP address of 10.0.0.2. Here's the very first thing that happens in all network communication. The sender has to decide whether the traffic is local, destined for a device on the same network, or remote, destined for a device on a different network. If it's locally delivered, the source can do it all by himself. If it's remotely delivered, the source cannot deliver the traffic directly to the destination. The source has to get it to its default gateway, which is an IP address, an interface on the router on that particular network, on that particular subnet. So in this example right over here, if you take a look, we've got the base 10 values in the upper right, 10.0.0.1 and 10.0.0.2. First one is the source IP address. Second is the destination IP address. They both have the same subnet mask. And then on your version, the colors are a little wonky. Um, but if you take a look, the Logical and process, which is what happens with the bits, 0 and 0, 0, 0 and 1 is 0, 1 and 0 is 0. The only time you have two bits that produce a 1 in the output is when the first bit and the second bit are both 1s. That's why it's called a logical and. 
And if you take a look right over here, if you have a 255 in the first octet of the subnet mask, those tens come down as is. If you've got zeros in the second, third, and fourth octets of the subnet mask, those octets come down as zeros. So if you take a look, the resultant network IDs for the source and the destination are the same. 10, 0, 0, 0. Got the binary layout as well, all 32 bits of the IP address are logically added with the 32 bits of the subnet mask. This is the base 2 representation of what you see above in base 10. When the host, the source of traffic, does the same logical AND process with its IP address and its subnet mask, as well as the destination's IP address, and, the destin and, and by the way, the destination subnet mask is not known. The source actually takes its subnet mask and logically adds it with the destination IP address. Well, there are a few reasons for this. First is that the source has no idea of figuring out what the heck the actual destination mask is, nor does it even matter. Because if the two devices are on the same network, what can you say about the masks? They're going to be the same. They're going to be the same. So in this case, the source concludes that the destination is on the same network, and it can deliver traffic directly. In this example right over here, advancing both of them, making sure that we see 11 over there, I changed the destination IP address. I just changed one bit. The ones column is on now. Before the ones column is off in the first octet of the destination IP address. And as a result, the two logical AND processes result in different network IDs. And because of that, the source says to himself, oh, uh, that guy is not on my network, and I'm going to need some help for my default gateway. Whereas in the first case, the source said, I, I don't need no stinking default gateway. I could deliver the traffic myself. So when you have, let's say, a fully qualified domain name, an FQDN or a host name, one of my favorite protocols, DNS, springs into action in the background. It does a lot of things, but the thing it's most famous for is turning a name into a number. But let's say, OK, we got that. That's in place. Or you know, somebody says, here, here's my IP address. Why don't you go ahead and ping it? We still don't know which device actually is in possession of that IP address, because didn't we say they were logical? Didn't we say they were software assigned? How do you actually assign or associate an actual logical address with a device that may be in possession of it? See, a lot of laptops around here, uh, the, the IP addresses that you're using right now are going to be different than the IP addresses you're going to be using here uh, next week, or if you come here tomorrow. But you know what? There is one address that you're using right now that's going to be the same today, tomorrow, next week, the week after that, when you go home, when you go to some other location, and that address is known as a MAC address, Media Access Control. And here's how the MAC address format looks. There are 12 hexadecimal digits. It's represented in base 16 hex, where the first six represent the manufacturer, the maker of that particular NIC network interface card. These are addresses that are burned into the NIC. They're physical. They're hardware-based. They are not hierarchical or geographical like IP addresses. They're flat, which means if you buy a network interface card and somebody in California buys a network interface card from the same online site, you very well could wind up with sequential MAC addresses in terms of the actual numbers themselves. So the first six always represent the manufacturer. And that's also known as a vendor ID, an OUI, organizationally unique identifier. Different manufacturers have different blocks of OUIs. And the second part is known quite simply as a device ID, where it's like a serial number assigned to each NIC. So these 48 bits, remember 48 bits, if there are 12 hex digits, each hex digit represents 4 bits. 12 times 4 is 48. These 48 bits will associate a NIC to the device that it's in. So now we bring back our stories over here. First, for local communication. In local communication, the source, in this case host A, wants to send traffic to the destination, in this case host B. So the source actually needs four different types of addresses, or four different addresses at least, to send that traffic. It knows what its IP address is, in this case 10.0.0.1. It certainly knows what its MAC address is. In this case, I'm using uh, 12 A's for this example. It knows what the destination IP address is, which is 10.0.0.2. Either it's going to be given this IP address or 
DNS will do its magic underneath the hood. But always starting off, the destination MAC address is going to be unknown. And we need a way to get that actual destination MAC address. So to do that, yeah, I'll just leave the key down there. To do that, actually, uh, where's your webcam? Oh, OK. So you know what? Raina, could you just read this for everybody? Oh, uh, try the four letters at the top. I know. I, I, right. I, I actually have new ones. I should refresh. This has been in my wall for a long time. So you guys, you guys see the commercials at night uh, for AARP? Right. So in order to send network traffic, you need one of these cards. Well, actually, since I kept it in my wall for so long, this one from June 2015, the, the first day was you know, hard for you to read, Brandon, right? It's a little scratched off over there. So that's more in line with network traffic. All network traffic starts off with a protocol known as ARP. Stands for Address Resolution Protocol. And here's how the beginning of local communication works. The source sends what we call an ARP request, which is a network broadcast. Every device on the network actually hears it. And the network broadcast says, in this case, you can see it's very uh, human friendly in Wireshark, who has IP address 10.0.0.2? I need your MAC address. So let's say everybody in this room right now got one of those messages from me. I'm trying to figure out what, uh, what Brayden's phone number is. So if I said, hey, Brayden, you know, you're all doing work. Uh, presentation hasn't started yet. Hey, Brayden, what's your, what's your phone number? It would bother everybody. Stop what you're doing. You have to interrupt whatever you're doing to read this network traffic, this ARP broadcast that I'm sending, this ARP request. But he'd be the only one who actually uh, would send the message back to me, and he wouldn't be kicked off at me like you guys would be. That's exactly what's happening in the store right over here, where host A sends an ARP request. It goes into the switch. The switch takes every single broadcast that goes into it and sends it out of all ports except the port on which the message originated. A destination broadcast MAC address looks like something you don't want on your transcript. Anybody know what it is? A bunch of Fs, 12 Fs to be exact, right. So the switch sends it to all devices. And all devices, when they see that destination MAC address of all Fs, they say, oh, this is a network broadcast. I'm going to go ahead and read it. And then everybody but one says, oh, man, you just wasted my time. But you know what? Host A did get the attention of host B. And as a result, host B sends an ARP request, a reply back into the switch. But the ARP reply is treated differently than the ARP request. The ARP request has a destination broadcast address, but the ARP reply has a destination unicast address, which means it's the actual MAC address of the NIC of host A. Host B got that information from the ARP request. So the switch only sends it to the port, the interface associated with host A, and the ARP reply doesn't bother everybody else on the network like the ARP request did. Now, does that sound familiar? It's a story like that. You know, some idiot, some moron, uh, late at night, screaming into an amplifier jacked up, a very capable amplifier, disrupting everybody in Brighton, but getting the job done and finding the street address of Bob Smith. Yeah, yeah that's, that's me. That was local communication. And in IPv4, that's the only way that you can do it. You've got to be very bothersome. You've got to be very annoying. IPv6 is radically different. In fact, there's no such thing as broadcasting in IPv6. It's been completely eliminated. And there's a whole new concept known as NDP, Neighbor Discovery Protocol. We could get into that another time. But now an obvious question that should be springing to your mind is how does the switch know where host A is? In other words, OK, it's a unicast address. It goes into the switch as the destination MAC address. How does the switch exactly know what to do with that actual frame that's going into it? See, how does the switch, this is, by the way, look at the process over here. The destination MAC address is now being filled in by host B, and this is the ARP reply being sent to host A. But if you take a look at this particular diagram, the switch learns who you are and where you are when you actually send traffic. That's why this table in RAM is known as the source address table. Cisco devices also refer to it as the MAC address table, not to be confused with the ARP cache. And it's also known as CAM, content addressable memory. So in this little diagram, we got Fred, Barney, Wilma, and Betty over here. As far as switch one goes, when Fred sends traffic into the switch, 
there we go. When Fred sends traffic into the switch, the switch says, oh, Fred, or it doesn't really say, oh, Fred, it says, oh, uh, 0200.1111.1111. Cisco devices refer to, you know, write MAC addresses a little bit differently than you might be used to in an operating system. They use four digits separated by three periods. Don't let that throw you, but this is an, a MAC address of Fred. So when Fred sends traffic into port F0 slash 1, pass Ethernet 0 slash 1, the switch learns where that MAC address is. So if the switch ever sees that MAC address as a destination MAC address, it only needs to send it out of port F01. Same thing with Barney, same thing with Wilma, same thing with Betty. So after these devices have sent anything into the switch, and if you've ever sniffed with Wireshark, you know that frames containing packets are constantly going in and out of your NIC without you even touching anything, after that switch learns where everybody is, you can see the result in tables. In the first table at the top, right over there, that's through the eyes of switch one, the, the one on the left. You can see that Fred and Barney, the, uh, the ones and the twos, they are known on the respective F0, FA0 slash one and fast ethernet 0 slash two ports. But what can, what can you deduce about what switch one thinks about Wilma and Betty? Where are Wilma and Betty located as far as switch one goes? What does it look like? Yes. Yeah, in other words, you've got these two switches, excellent, that are, that are connected together. The frames that are coming in from Wilma and Betty from switch two to switch one will both be learned and associated with the gigabit ethernet interface, gig zero one over there. So that's why gig zero one is what switch one thinks that both Wilma and Betty are connected to. If you look at the diagram for switch two, it's inverted. Now for switch two, Wilma and Betty are associated with the actual ports that they are connected to, but now Fred and Barney are associated with that uplink gig zero two on switch number two. As devices send traffic into the switch, the switch says, ah, I know that's where you are. And that's how, uh, there we go. That's how when host B sends his ARP reply back to host A, that's how the switch is able to send it just back to host A and that out of all the other ports like is done for the actual ARP request, which is a broadcast. In fact, here's another great little uh, image over here. Fred now is sending traffic to Barney. If the switch knows where Barney is, it just goes out of F02 and not out of F03 or F04. Of course, you don't want to get other people's traffic. Back in the day, there was another device that started with an H. You know, it's part of the things that I don't allow you to say uh, in my presence. But let's just say it started with an H. You know, it's along the lines of uh, Telnet and POP3 and Cat5 and oh, I said it was a hub, a hub that sent traffic out of all ports no matter what. There were security concerns. There were bandwidth concerns. The switch is a layer two device that upgrades this old obsolete layer one device known as a hub because specifically of this MAC address table. One more diagram right over here. As you can see through the eyes of switch two, Fred and Barney, it's like Fred and Barney are connected to the gig zero two interface, even though of course they technically are not. That's just the uplink between the actual two switches. And because switch two does know where Wilma is, Switch 2 sends the frame destined for Wilma, the threes, out of F03 as opposed to sending it to Betty as well. And it certainly doesn't send it out of the interface on which the message originated. Okay, remote communication now. You take a look at this diagram. In this little story, I've got the source of 12001, some guy on the lower left of this diagram, one of those machines down there, that's going to be 12001. He's got to send traffic to 14001. So how is that done? Well, you know what? Starting off, it works the same way. Host A, or the source of traffic, Mr. 12001 says, I got to figure out what? I got to figure out whether the communication is local or remote. In this case, after the two logical ends, the source says, oh, they are, we're on different networks. I cannot deliver this traffic directly. I need some help. So at this point, once again, the ARP card is taken out of the wallet by, in this case, uh, 12001. And 1201 sends an ARP broadcast. The ARP broadcast says, if your IP address is, and then blank, I need your MAC address. So whose MAC address is the source looking for now? 
fair enough. Well, that, that it would be looking for the actual destination if it was local traffic. But you know what? When I saw those candlesticks in, in the bags coming home, unpacking in Rochester, I wasn't going to drive. You know, I love Staten Island. It's my birthplace. You guys ever seen Practical Jokers? They're from Staten Island. So, Wu-Tang Clan as well. So we, we're well represented. So when, when I saw those candlesticks, I did not want to drive all the way back to Staten Island. I was just in the car for six and a half hours with two whiny kids. So what I did was I thought it would be better to look up the nearest UPS store. I brought it to the UPS store. The UPS store, by the way, in Brighton, sent the actual package of my mom's candlesticks to another UPS facility, who sent it to another UPS facility, who sent it to another UPS facility, until it got to Staten Island. And then they found out they were in the uh, zone of my parents' house. So they put it on a truck, and they sent it out, and that's how my mom got her candlesticks back. So in this case, when the source determines that the destination is on a different network, what it does is it Googles the nearest UPS store. In other words, it looks in its, in its TCP IP configuration and says, oh, I need the actual IP address of my default gateway. It locates that default gateway. And then it sends an ARP request. Let's say the gateway in this case is 120099. Then the source will send an ARP request, which is, again, a broadcast. And it says, hey, everybody out there, I'm, I'm going to bother you all, but I'm just looking for 120099. If that's your IP address, I need your MAC address. Everybody in the network hears it, including all those other little machines down there, but only the default gateway, the router interface. If you want to look at the picture, it's going to be the bottom interface on R2. That interface has the role of default gateway for the network, and that IP address uh, is associated with the corresponding MAC address, and it's that MAC address that's sent back to the source in an ARP reply. Okay, so look at our little diagram right over here now. The unknown has been crossed out. I'm just going to use uh, two hex digits to represent MAC addresses. Let's say the source MAC address is AA, and now the default gateway's MAC address is BB. So this is me bringing that brown box to the UPS store in Brighton. Now what does the UPS store in Brighton do? It doesn't deliver the package to my parents. The UPS store in Brighton now has to look up the next UPS facility to send the actual package to and route to Staten Island, New York. And when it does conclude what the appropriate uh, store is, or the appropriate facility, watch this mouse right over here and over here, it's going to be this interface on R1. Look at the routing tables. This is a generalized look at a routing table. The switches have these MAC address tables, also known as CAM content addressable memory, also known as SAT source address table. Well, the routers have things called, very appropriately named, routing tables. And they contain destination networks and the next hop IP address in terms of who to send the traffic to to get in that particular direction. So if you look at the routing table associated with R2, to get to the 14 network, who does R2 have to send the traffic to? I just want to make sure I don't throw everything down. Who does, who does it have to get the traffic to? R1, you got it, which is this interface up here. In reality, if you look at a routing table with the show IP route command, you will actually see an IP address and or an interface and not just something like R1, for instance. So R2 needs to get the traffic to R1, assuming everything is Ethernet, and there is something called Metro Ethernet to go large distances. Assuming everything is Ethernet, R2 on its upper right interface will send an ARP request saying, hey, next hop IP address, I need your MAC address. The left interface of R1 will send an ARP reply back to the upper right interface of R2 saying, here's my MAC address. It's going to be DB. We guys progressing in our little pattern. So the source MAC address now is going to be the right interface or yeah, the right interface of R2. In other words, you've got a lot of data structures that go on in the world of networking. At the lowest level, layer two, we've got these things called frames. The frames contain the source and destination MAC address and a bunch of other things as well. Inside the frames, you've got IP packets, which contain, among other things, source IP address and destination IP address. Every time a packet moves from router to router or hop to hop or network to network, the frame, the outer encapsulation, is destroyed and removed 
and replaced with a new frame, with a new source MAC address and a new destination MAC address. And that's exactly what we see right over here. It's like when a UPS box moves from one facility to the next. This is how you track it. A new label goes on, tracked in and out, in the new facility, from the old facility. And then and you want to track it. It's in a new location. Maybe my, can, my mom's candlesticks are in Syracuse at some point. At that point, you're going to see on those tracking labels, uh, in from the uh, Syracuse uh, UPS facility, out the uh, Binghamton UPS facility. Although that would be, uh, yeah, actually that would be in the other direction. But the point is that every time the frame goes out of another interface, it actually doesn't. It's removed, which means the MAC addresses change every hop. So that's why if you take a look at the destination MAC address and the source MAC address in our story right now, they have changed. But notice that the destination IP address and the source IP address do not change. If they did, you want to know who the traffic is coming from and where the heck it's got to go. Those have to remain constant. Those addresses never change in the transmission of a packet to its eventual destination. So now that R1 has the traffic, if you take a look, R1 is going to ARP for the MAC address of this interface right over here of R4. R4 is going to send an ARP reply back. And once again, the frame is destroyed and recreated. New source MAC address, new destination MAC address. Again, notice that the destination and source IP addresses are not changing. Whoops. Eventually, the traffic will make it over here. And I'm not uh, synchronized on the slides. There we go. Eventually, the right interface of R1 will send it to R4. And R4, at this point, will send an ARP request bothering everybody in this network right over here saying, hey, 14001, that's the actual destination. I need your MAC address. 14001 sends an ARP reply back to R4, and R4 delivers the traffic. From each hop, the first thing that's looked at is the destination MAC address. So from Router 2's perspective, going back to the beginning of the story, Router 2 says, yes, that's my MAC address, but looks in the packet now. No, that's not my IP address. And that's when R2 looks in its routing cable and finds the next hop router to send the traffic to. If the router does not have knowledge of a destination network, it could have what we call the default route of itself. It could send all packets to a specific router. If it doesn't have one of those default routes or explicit knowledge of a destination network, what do you think the router does with the packet? It actually drops it, drops it on the spot. And this is a nice little illustration how every time a packet moves from one router slash network slash hop to the next, that outer encapsulation, the frame, is stripped off and replaced on the new outgoing interface, but the packet containing the source and destination IP addresses, they never change. They remain constant. That's one of the reasons why we need those two forms of addresses, the physical address and the logical address. But OK, we got traffic at the destination. How does it get to where it's supposed to be on the actual machine? In other words, you can have a machine that's running both an FTP server and a web server and a bunch of other server services. How does traffic to the FTP server go to the FTP server? How does traffic for the web server go to the actual web server? So we've pretty much established that the way that these ones and zeros go in and out of a machine is through the NIC, through the network interface card. But once it's in the machine, how does it actually get to the correct service? And the way in and the way out of a machine well, physically is through the NIC, but logically is through an actual program. A program that runs in the background, independent of a sign-in, independent of a login, we call that a service. And machines run server services, and machines run client services. Technically speaking, when you say, I've got a server, you're not really talking about the physical machine. You're talking about the software services that are running on that actual device. In the world of Linux, we don't call services services. We actually call them daemons. And in the world of Linux, we actually have a term service that means something different. It's a basically a, a command that calls a script that launches the daemon. Anytime you see that word service in Linux, it doesn't mean the same thing as service in Windows. And when you talk about a program that's running, an instantiated program that's running in memory, we call that instantiation of a program, a process which can be broken down into smaller units of execution known as threads. All right, so how does that still help us in our little story over here? 
So if the way in and out of a machine physically is through the NIC and the way in and out logically is through a program or service, well, how the heck do you go in and out of a program or service? That's where we have another form of addressing here called a port. A port is a number, a logical way in and out of a machine, or technically in and out of the actual program or service. It's an endpoint in communication. It's the client service connecting to the server service on a different machine. A logical endpoint that's represented by a number. So in our little story right over here, uh, we've got two people, and they actually do have names. The guy's name is Frank Thomas Peters, and the female is Helen Teresa Thomasina Parker. Helen Teresa Thomasina Parker and Frank Thomas Peters. Frank Thomas Peters in this apartment building lives in apartment number 21. And Helen Teresa Thomasina Parker, anybody know what, uh, just give me the apartment number she lives in? 80. 80. She lives in 80. More on that in a couple of seconds. So when the mailman comes with a big, large sack of mail, he puts messages for Frank in the box marked 21 and the box in the mail for Helen in box, he just got it, in the box numbered 80. So that's how these two people who have the same street address are able to get their own respective traffic. This is a port number. For instance, file transfer protocol servers send and receive traffic on port 21. For control traffic, there's another port that used to be 20 with uh, a different form of FTP that's no longer used today. HTTP, web servers without encryption, of course, they're becoming more rare by the day. Everything is uh, TLS, so it should be nowadays, transport layer security. Hypertext transfer protocol, that's her. She lives in port 80, so those web server services send and receive on port 80. You could have a machine that's running both an FTP server and an HTTP web server, and that's how the traffic that is destined for the FTP server gets to the FTP server, and how traffic destined for the web server gets to the web server. They, they're accessible by the same MAC address, the same IP address. We need one more differentiating factor, and that is the port number. Port numbers come in three different categories. First category is well-known ports. You got a zero there, but zero is unusable. It's a cascade number. We'll do that another time. But those are all those famous server ports that you learn and you study and you hear about and you see in actuality in Wireshark, only one of the numbers in that range, and by the way, not all of those numbers are used, but only one number is actually used for a client service. Anybody know which one that is? I took my net services class, you know. Is it 1024? Not 1024. It, in, it's actually in the first range also from, from 0 to 1023. It's actually port 68, which is used by DHCP clients. More on that another time. They're all server ports except for that one that has to be a reserved client port. You'll, put, you'll see more about that in uh, NSSA 245 with me. The last category over here, the dynamic ports, are what clients use. They open up applications, open up a port when they need to, and they're called dynamic because they're elastically closed after the communication has stopped. So for instance, if you have a web browser and the web browser wants to communicate with a web server that's using encryption, that's using TLS transport layer security, not like Helen Teresa Thomasina Parker, got to come up with a, a name that fits uh, TLS. But anyway, if you take, uh, by the way, anybody know what port number I'm talking about? What port number is TLS? 443, excellent. So now the client sends traffic to port 443 of the server, but it opens up one of these dynamic ports. Let's say port 60,000. And after the communication ceases, port 443 is still open up, on the open up on the server, but the client closes that port that it dynamically opened because there's no reason to keep it open anymore. Just like when you leave your house, you close your doors and you shut your windows because an open port represents a vulnerability, a way into the system, a flaw, a weakness that can be exploited by exploits. The middle category is a little uh, wishy-washy category. It used to actually uh, be more of a thing where you actually registered for a port for a particular protocol or for a particular software application. Nowadays, it's more of a non sequitur, which is why a lot of times, if you're sniffing in Wireshark, a lot of operating systems like to use the ports close to 1,000 instead of using this range for some particular reason. But for the most part, registered ports are a thing of the past. 
Now, one of the most misunderstood concepts that I've seen, especially in my consulting when I go around from company to company, is the fact that people think that firewalls open or close ports. Firewalls do not open ports. Firewalls do not close ports. What do firewalls do? Give me where it starts with F. Filter. Which means, you know, I was once uh, on a consulting gig, and some guy said to me at, at the company, uh, can you open up, or, or can you shut port whatever, uh, let's say SSH, can you shut in by what port SSH uses? 22. Can you, uh, can you stop external SSHing into our infrastructure on the firewall? Uh, can you, sh actually his lit literal words were, can you shut port 22 on the firewall? And I said, no. He said, no, no really, can you shut port 22 on the firewall? I said, no. So I, you, you came highly recommended, you don't know how to do that? I go, I know how to write a rule that filters any incoming traffic destined for port 22 on your internal network, but I don't know a way where I could do something to your firewall that turns off the uh, SSH uh, server service on your SSH server. He said, what do you mean? So I said, actually, the way to start a service, how do you, how do you start a service? You launch a service through a command line interface or through a GUI if you're uh, uh, looking to be not as cool. Uh, so you can launch a server service. Once that server service starts, the port is open. So start FileZilla, port 21 is open. Stop FileZilla, port 21 is closed. The way to start a service is really the same way as to open up a port. Starting a service opens a port. Stopping a service closes a port. Writing a rule on a firewall has nothing to do with the service starting or stopping. It's filtering. It's either letting traffic through or it's not letting traffic through. Now, in conclusion, how are we doing on time, by the way? OK. I haven't gotten into batteries since uh, COVID-19. Just give me the time. OK. That helps. So. We said that these MAC addresses are in the layer two frames of OSI. And these IP addresses are in the layer three IP packets. Where are these port, number found, port numbers found? Well, they're either in layer four TCP segments or layer four UDP datagrams. Now, when you look at the various columns over here, TCP, and I don't, I don't like to use the word reliable. I like to say guaranteed. You know, as long as there's an actual connection, and somebody doesn't uh, smash a machine with a, an axe or cut a cable with a uh, scissor, a pair of scissors. If that's the case, then you know what? TCP is guaranteed. And people have been lying to you all your lives. Everybody was, uh, used to say that the only two things guaranteed in life are death and taxes. If you take my classes, I tell you no. There are actually three things that are guaranteed in life, death, taxes, and TCP. TCP is as guaranteed as death and taxes, provided everything is in place. UDP is not guaranteed. In other words, TCP guarantees that the destination will get the traffic, and if it doesn't, the source will realize that through a process we cover in that services, and the source resends the traffic. UDP is like taking a stamp, putting it on an envelope, and then just mailing it. If it gets there, it gets there. If it doesn't, it doesn't. The source doesn't know. The destination doesn't know if a postal worker is having a bad day. I hope nobody's related to postal worker. No offense intended. So when you have... TCP versus UDP. Look at some of these other uh, buzzwords over here. A connection is established between source and destination before the traffic is sent with TCP. So that's like you go to the post office, you get one of those green and white stickers, return receipt, and when the letter gets to the destination, they actually have to sign for it. I'm sure you've seen those. TCP is guaranteed, connection-oriented, and it's acknowledged. Anytime a TCP segment arrives at a destination, the destination has got to say, I got it. And if it doesn't say, I got it, the source assumes that the traffic was lost and actually has to resend the traffic. So which one is better, TCP or UDP? Right, uh, you got the answer too quickly. Some, sometimes if people hesitate, I say, well, what are you going to wear when you're 90? Depends, depends. For communication where you want accuracy and integrity, and 100% a guarantee TCP is used. Some examples, email, web traffic, FTP. But where you don't want to slow down the communication, which is what TCP does with a very completely different header than uh, the UDP datagrams have, and it's very lightweight, and there's no acknowledgments, and there's no connection, UDP is used. So for protocols like DNS, except for zone transfers that use TCP, and DHCP, UDP is always used because you know what? If you ask your server a question and it doesn't give you an answer, 
Ask again. If you ask your professor a question and he or she doesn't give you an answer, ask again. VoIP, live streaming, those are examples of where UDP is used. So what is YouTube used, TCP or UDP? Yes, very sharp. In other words, if you're just watching a video, uh, let's say from the Weissman 52 YouTube channel, it's actually TCP. You're, at, you're actually watching it from your machine. It's downloaded locally because uh, TC, uh, TCP is used, if it's not live streaming, to provide that accuracy and that integrity. UDP is used where you don't care about the accuracy and integrity as much as you care about what? Speed, efficiency. If it's a video stream and a one or a zero gets missed or corrupted, you might see some degradation in sound or video. You're probably not going to notice it, but you don't care because it's a fleeting moment in time. So applications choose whether their layer four protocol is going to be UDP or TCP. So that's an example of UDP, where I'm sending the messages. And if it gets there, it gets there. If it doesn't, it doesn't. The destination has no idea that it didn't get there. The source has no idea that the destination didn't get it. By the way, when I gave this presentation over Zoom last year, that's the part that I missed the most. That's an example of UDP, unreliable, not connection oriented. Now, come on, come on, come on. Now we're going to do an example of TCP. Hi, I'm Jess. No, two, two, uh, oh, let me do first. No, no, come back, come back, Jess. I need you. All right. Hi, I'm Professor Weissman. Hi, I'm Jess Beckwith. Can I send you some markers? Sure. And then now you, what sure. you're going to say is, can I send some, some stuff your way, too? Yeah, sure, can I send some stuff your way, too? OK. Uh, Professor Weissman, I got your marker. Color. Uh, I got your green marker. I did not get your. Well, you don't know that I sent that. <laughs> Now, he wouldn't, he wouldn't say I didn't get the red marks because he doesn't know it's coming. What he would do is he would just say nothing. And I would say, wait a minute. I'd put this in RAM. I'd say, hmm, he told me he got the green marker. He didn't tell me he got the red marker. TCP timer has expired. Let me send it again. Where's I got your red marker. See how that works? TCP. A little bit of overhead, but it's a 100% guarantee, like death and taxes. Great to see you, by the way, Jessica. And the way that TCP does this is with something called a TCP three-way handshake, which is what we just did. The source sends a TCP segment with the SYN, synchronized flag on, and a number associated called a synchronized number. If the destination gets its request for synchronization, it sends a TCP segment with the ACK or acknowledgement flag on, that increments the sequence number by one. So nine, let's say, plus one is 10. But also in step two of the three-way handshake, the destination says, I want to send some stuff your way as well, and comes up with its own sequence number and turns on its SYN flag, which is why we call step two SYNAC. Step number three is where the source of the traffic says to the destination, let's rock. I got your request, and increments your sequence number by one. So if you sent me uh, 1099, I send back 1,100. After that point, the sequence and acknowledgement numbers are actually the mechanism that's used to keep track of every byte that's sent from source to destination. Because if they arrive out of order, if a byte stream has not yet been acknowledged in the TCP segments, the source knows exactly which bytes it needs to resend and sends them again. So thank you for joining me. And uh, follow me on social media if you aren't ready. LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, CSC Prof on the letter two. For the first one, you'll have to look it up. In fact, uh, when I get back to my office in two minutes, I am going to post a Kahoot quiz to my LinkedIn. And you're going to take it. And you're going to be able to compete and post messages on the scoreboard and uh, have some fun with that. So look for a LinkedIn post with the Kahoot quiz three minutes from now. Thank you very much. I'll see you guys next year. Now here's the tricky part. <laughs>